One of the most important aspects of software development is the architecture of your application, which is basically the blueprint for how the web app is structured. Think about the first decent sized app you ever built. I'd be willing to bet that you unknowingly implemented the monolithic architecture, or basically where you put all of the code into a single code base tightly coupled together. But if you want to efficiently scale your app from 100 users to 100,000 users, then maybe you want to take a look at microservice architecture. But that's not all there is to consider in terms of architecture. I mean, how many tiers is your application? Where does each component live? All on the same server? Or each have their own server? Are you going with a serverless architecture? And if you're on Web 2, you're probably doing client server. But if you're on Web 3, then you're doing peer to peer. All of this matters in the context of what type of app that you want to build. So I've broken these down, put them into levels or buckets that are actually comparable and created explanations in a way for you to simply understand the differences in the types of web app architecture. But first I'm stoked to announce that JetBrains Space is a sponsor of today's video. And I may take a wild guess that you've already heard of JetBrains. They've created IntelliJ Idea, PyCharm, Writer, Team City, and Kotlin, among many other tools for developers and software teams alike. But today I wanna to talk to you about a specific product created by JetBrains, JetBrains Space. Space is really a one-stop shop for all development tools. It's a unified platform that covers the entire software development pipeline. Everything you need in a single tool set. Source code control hosting using Git, code reviews with merge requests and quality gates, automation jobs for building and deploying applications, project management tools, checklists for planning, an issue tracker and visual boards, packaging container registries for publishing artifacts, the first class integration with JetBrains IntelliJ based IDEs, and cloud development environment for remote development with JetBrains IDEs. But it's not only about the development aspect, it's also about the organizational and communication tools. You have a team directory for managing the company's organizational structure, management of vacations, absences and locations, chats, collaborative documents, blogs, meeting management, personal calendars, and to-do lists for task management. So if you work in a team, and especially if you use any JetBrains products, IDEs, I would heavily recommend checking out Space because it puts everything you need for communicating and collaborating with your team in one place. You can try it out for free using my link in the description, but you can also upgrade to Space Team using my code, which is also in the description just below the link. So what is Web App Architect? To put it simply, the web app architecture of a system describes its major components, their relationships, and how they interact with each other. It essentially serves as a blueprint, the layout of it all. And there are two main ways in which it's laid out, at least in the overarching, more broad idea of architecture, with the main one being client server architecture. It would be irresponsible for me not to start with this as it is the fundamental building block of the web. So let's take the web app. We typically have the client side or front end, the server side or back end, the database, and everything in between. And not all web applications are set up just like this, where you have the client side, the server side, which is the business logic in this case, and then the database all living on their own physical machines. This is where different tiers in software architecture comes into play. A one tier application will have all of this on a single machine. A two tier application can be split one of two ways with all of the code, so the client side and then the server side business logic living on one machine and the database living on a second machine, or the client side living on one machine and then the server side business logic and database living on the second machine. That's two tier. What you're looking at now is three tier with each individual section being in its own machine. And finally you have N tier, which is anything more than a three tier application. This typically takes into consideration the single responsibility principle where each individual component lives on its own machine. So if you have five or 10 different components in terms of business logic, you're gonna have five or 10 different machines just to cover this. And for this example, we're sticking with a three tier application. So on the client side, as you interact with the web application, it'll send an HTTP request to the server, the business logic, which will then query the database if needed, which will respond with that data, which then we will transfer transform that data as needed to send an HTTP response back to the client. And I will say for all of the well actuallys, that'll be in the comment section saying, well actually you send the HTTP request to a web server, which then sends an OS thread to the application server, then does all of that and back through. Actually you're speculating there. However, by strict definition, web server is a subset of an application server. So all of that occurs in our server tier right here. 
Now let's take YouTube as a real world example. When you were on youtube.com and you saw this video pop up and you clicked on this video, you sent an HTTP request from the client side, which is what you see, to the server side, which is what you don't see unless something has gone terribly wrong, in order to access the business logic, the database, and everything that you need in order to populate the web page that you're on right now, which contains the video, the description, all of the metadata, the comment section, the recommendation system on your, well, that side, I think, everything that you see right now. It accesses all of that information and then responds back to the client side with that information and serves it to you. Basically every website you use, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, your banking app, is all client server architecture. However, there is something that opposes client server architecture and that is known as peer-to-peer -peer architecture. There are a small percentage of businesses that use this and I'll give you some examples, but something that you can really wrap your head around is Web3, the blockchain. Peer-to-peer -peer architecture is the base of blockchain technology. It is a network of computers, also known as nodes, that are able to communicate with each other without the need of a central server, like that of client server architecture. So it rules out the possibility of single point failure, which I think, I don't know if it was earlier this year or in 2021, when Facebook and everything that Facebook owned, WhatsApp, Instagram went down for a day because their servers failed. That is one of the negatives of client server and one of the avoidances or solutions that peer-to-peer -peer provides. Peer-to-peer -peer technology, however, is not only used in Web3 and blockchain technology. It is that it actually exists currently with some online gaming platforms. For example, Blizzard uses peer-to-peer -to, -peer to download games between users. They use this for Diablo 3, StarCraft 2, and WoW. But for the vast majority of what the internet is today, it is client-server architecture. So now we have the next level of architecture. Again, these are these are levels created by myself. I just wanted to be able to give you architecture that is actually comparable to each other and not just a bunch thrown in your face. So this is where monolithic microservices and serverless come into play. In a monolithic architecture, all the modules will be coded in a single code base tightly coupled together. This is unlike the microservices architecture where every distinct feature of an application may have one or more dedicated microservices powering it. This is how basically everything used to be built because it's, I mean, it's simple, it's fast, you can easily deploy it. However, there are a lot more negatives than there are positives because it's not scalable. It's not reliable. There are single points of failure. To put in perspective, every single time you add a single line of code, you would have to redeploy the entire application. And not only do you have to redeploy it, but if something breaks, it breaks the entire application. However, the answer to all of those problems is solved with microservice architecture. This is where you have a collection of services that each serve a unique responsibility. Every single service is deployed and lives separately from one another. And to complete the business logic, they can connect to each other as needed. Or to put it simply, it's modular. So where you have all of these different aspects of YouTube that you can see on your page right now, you have a software development team that works on one service, the recommendation system. And then you have another team that works on another service, the search function. Then you have another team that works on the comment system, so on and so forth. If they change one line of code, they're only redeploying their service, not the entire app. And if they break something, they're breaking only their service, not the entire app. And then of course, with it being modular, you can see just how scalable it is because each service can be scaled independently based on traffic. And where there is monolithic architecture and microservice architecture, there's also something called serverless architecture, also known as serverless, serviceless, serverless computing or function as a service. It's a software design pattern where our function, which is a part of the microservices responsibility, is hosted by a third party. This is your AWS Lambda functions, your Azure functions, I, I never know how to pronounce that, and your Firebase cloud functions. Did I explain, oh, 
new shirt. That's weird. Did I explain that well enough? Let me give you one more example. As if you were online shopping, you have a product catalog, you have a checkout system, and you have a shipping process. In a monolithic application, all of those are built and deployed as one holistic unit. In a microservice application, each individual component is broken down into its own service. A benefit here is that each individual microservice can have its own language, its own libraries, and typically have its own database. And a serverless application, in this instance, we're going to be talking about serverless microservices, break the microservices down even smaller into their own individual event-driven functions. For example, the shipping microservice will have multiple functions within. And once an order is marked as ready to ship, that event could trigger a function that validates the customer. A successful validation could trigger another function that generates a shipping label. And finally, creation of that shipping label could trigger a final function that sends a shipping confirmation email to the customer. See, they're built with serverless functions which execute small blocks of code with one block of code triggering the next. Goodbye.